Hi, and welcome to the new Property Show. I'm Steve McManaman. Joining us today will be Jason from Multi Dwell Developments, talking to us about the A's to Z's of bathroom renovations and the top tips needed to make your bathroom stand out. Gary Brown will be joining us for his regular segment on wealth creation. Amol and Abdullah will be talking to us about the common mistakes and how to avoid them. But first, Rory with Money Tips. Last time we spoke about setting a bit of a, a, a bit of a plan in place, we spoke about setting a goal to help you manage your money a bit better and help you get in a better financial place. Now this time, it's all about setting your budget. What you wanna do is you wanna see exactly where your money's going. You wanna see what's coming in and what's going out. It's so important uh, to get a snapshot of that over a bit of time. So you might wanna choose the, the last six months and see exactly what has been going in and out of your bank accounts over that time. Banks are pretty good these days. They've got it all online, you can see it um, and you can download it, which is really important. And so you can sit there and you can look at exactly what you're spending money on. Now, I'm sure if you did that, you would see areas in your budget that you are just spending far too much money on and I guarantee you, you're gonna be surprised by it. You might be spending too much on insurance or you might be spending too much on an interest rate or not getting enough interest rate if you're, if you're a saver. But it's just really, really important to have a look and see where your money is going and the only way you can do that is by setting a budget. You might, for instance, see that you're spending so much in car expenses and car expenses are a great way to save some money. Firstly, you've got potentially your car repayment, you've got you know, your servicing costs, um, where you can change that and maybe catch public transport a couple of times a week and see the benefit that that can have in your budget. There are so many ways that you can fine tune and tweak it, which means that the more money you can save today means the closer you're gonna to get to that goal that we spoke about last time. Jace, thanks for joining us on the new property show. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. You're a, uh, you're a builder. Um, how'd that come to be? Basically, after school, um, I actually went into soccer. I wanted to become a professional soccer player. Mm -hmm. But I went to Scotland, trialled there, but it didn't work out. Came back, became a carpenter. Then after I got qualified, went into supervising for a fair few years and then was looking to get my builder's license. I got it about three years ago now and just slowly building up from bathrooms to extensions and new builds as well. And you've been predominantly working, I guess, on, on word of mouth now. Yep. I uh, saw one of your Instagram stories recently. Your reels had over 250,000 views, which is incredible. Um, that was a bathroom, wasn't it? Yeah, so that was actually for our famous clients, Mary and Martha Keller. Mm -hmm. Mary was on Big Brother and Martha was on Married at First Sight. Um, we actually delivered the project before Martha had the baby right on schedule and yeah they're they're really happy with the bathroom. Perfect so bathrooms what what's needed what are people asking for in yep. 2023 uh, what's what's involved? Basically once we get our call we'll organize a uh, go there give them a quote and then once they're happy with the quote we'll go back and really go deep into the detail you know do we want square set floor to ceiling tiles you know, niches with LEDs, mm -hmm. shaving cabinets, whatever they want, we can deliver. Um, so basically, anything over $10,000 requires a contract. Anything over $16,000 requires warranty insurance. So we'll provide, the builder provides the client with warranty insurance. And we, ha we do that before we start the job. Perfect, and how long say, I guess, a bathroom renovation take? Is that a yeah. couple of weeks, is it? Yeah. yeah four to seven weeks it just depends on how much detail or what's involved if it's on slab or if it's on stumps okay and yeah. shower bases nowadays are people looking at the the double shower heads are the rain showers still in uh, what's happening with those yeah a lot of people starting to want it from the ceiling now or really long shower heads with a big rail mm -hmm. um, but yeah i'm a new generation builder so we do a lot of step downs with mm -hmm. preformed shower base sometimes we use say there's the Weedy system, mm -hmm. the Pascal system, or Demtec. Mm -hmm. You should really look into it because it's the new generation. Perfect. And what about DIY um, versus getting a registered builder? Is it worth taking the risk or should we get someone like you in? Definitely use someone that's registered because I've been to a lot of dodgy jobs and then mm -hmm. we end up just fixing it anyway, you know? Yeah. And a lot of them aren't done to standard. 
Okay, and nowadays, what about the enclosed toilets? Uh, are people getting bigger bathrooms or smaller bathrooms? How, how's that looking? Basically, a lot of people are going for the internal wall cistern toilet, yeah. which is just the, the panels. Mm -hmm. You just press the buttons. Um, but basically, whatever room that they've got, we just deliver. I'll go there, I'll actually draw them out a new design, mm -hmm. give them a design, and we'll just work together, build the relationship, and deliver the highest quality bathroom that we can. Okay, now, um, the other thing too, I guess, for the ladies watching the show and some of the gentlemen, uh, walk-in robes, um, obviously normally connected next to the bathrooms. Yeah. Do you advise having that right next door, or would you separate those, or how, how's that with moisture uh, and mould? Good thing you asked. Well, I yeah. actually went to one last week. Mm -hmm. The lady actually wanted to remove her robe and create an extra, extra room into the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So we're actually gonna put a shower and a toilet in there with a little vanity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of people are extending out because ever since COVID, um, a lot of people are wanting to do stuff to their bathrooms. Okay, well, they're spending a lot more time at home now. Would you recommend Caesar stone, laminate, soft closing drawers, open cavities? So what are the compartments gonna need to look like when designing, I guess, the bench top on the bathroom? Yeah, well, it really depends how big the bathroom is. Mm -hmm. Say if you've got 1500 mm -hmm. to play with, usually three panels. Mm -hmm. And with the shaving cabinet, three panels as well. We usually put our PowerPoints in there now mm -hmm. and also the drawers with the PowerPoints. Basically, a lot of people are wanting the 100 mil stone mm -hmm. and undermount where you just put your hands underneath and wash your hands. It's very classy. It's almost like a, I guess, almost like a soft towel or a luxury feel yeah, nowadays. Yeah. Uh, they're really spending, I guess, a lot more time there. What about the, um, the ambient lighting that goes around the mirrors? Is that still a popular feature? Well, a lot of people these days are wanting the LEDs. LEDs underneath the shaving cabinet and underneath the vanity. Beautiful. Well, we can't wait to check out your work. Uh, look forward to having you again yeah. back on the new property show and can't wait to see what else we talk about. Thanks, Steve. On today's segment, we're going to talk about trust and buying an investment, un investment property under a trust. But first we have to talk about CGT discount and how that applies to a trust. So when we buy an investment asset and we hold it for more than 12 months, we may be entitled to a 50% discount on the capital gains. With that in mind, the capital gains has to be passed through the trust to an individual. When we talk about a hatch away property, we buy that with the sole purpose of making capital gains while that property covers all of its investment expenses, including its loan. And because of that, we're going to have a capital gain at the end of the sale of the property. So we want to make sure that we're entitled to the 50% discount on the capital gain, and therefore we're able to reduce our taxes. So how does a trust work? So each year we buy investments and we make profit under a trust. We have to distribute the profit. And because of that, we get to distribute to the beneficiaries that can be the mum, dad, parents, children over 18, or a company. And each of the different beneficiaries will have a different marginal tax rates and have different opportunities to minimise our taxes. So with a trust, say we buy a property for $500,000 and over the next couple of years it increases in value to $600,000. That would mean we'd have $100,000 capital gain if we were to sell it. And because we have a trust, we'd be able to distribute that capital gain to an individual and get a 50% discount on that capital gain. And therefore, we'd be able to pay individual tax rates of the $50,000, which may be 37, 39% tax rate. Now I know this all sounds confusing, but these little tips and tricks help save tens of thousands of dollars in taxes per year. Because of the complex nature here, I always recommend you speak to your accountant and your advisor to make sure that you're maximizing your trust distribution to pay the least amount of taxes possible. This also gives us the ability to do income splitting because you or your spouse may not be working, your parents may not be working, and your children may not be working. So we're able to divide the income of the trust up among several people and pay out a distribution accordingly. On 30th of June every year, we do minutes or a resolution that determine where the profits go, which then allows us to do the tax return sometime all the way up until May the following year. One of the big questions I get asked about a trust is can I get finance? And I always go back to the mentality, if you can get finance under your personal name to buy a property, you can get it under a trust. However, you need to go speak to your mortgage broker or the bank to get exact correct information. This is why it's so important to partner with professionals over the next 10 years to make sure that the next 20 years and 30 years that you're invested correctly.
All right, guys, welcome to the show, Abdullah and Amal. Uh, thank you for joining us on your property show. Today, we're going to be discussing, um, I guess, common mistakes uh, when purchasing a new property, uh, wealth creation, and of course, three asset classes. Thanks, Steve. Uh, no, thanks for having us on. Um, look, you know, when it comes to, you know, like, you know, uh, becoming a, you know, a, a property investor in the market, I think it's really important having a, an investment portfolio that's diversified, right? Mm -hmm. So. A lot of clients or a lot of investors when they get in they, they sort of have a budget and they don't know where to buy and some people just buy their next door neighbor's house because it feels more comfortable and they can see it and touch it and feel it every day but i think you know looking at you know what what type of property will suit your lifestyle and, and making sure that the property you buy doesn't compromise your quality of life mm -hmm. so you know the, the three asset classes we generally work when we're working with when we're working with our clients they're generally um foundational assets, mm -hmm. which is sort of your like, you know, landlocked suburbs established, um, you know, circa plus $1 million, but they're yielding quite poorly, so 2 to 3%. So more like in a city. Yeah, in a city yeah. suburb, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they're really good so for like, you know, creating some serious wealth, you know, really good sort of foundational assets to have, um, but not a lot of people can afford that. And, you know, you could, you know, you'd be in a, in a quite a negative sort of cash flow position. Um, the second asset class is when we look at sort of momentum assets, so more speculative. So we look at sort of, um, regions that are, you know, landlocked, um, you know, got a really good macroeconomic, so underpinned by a really mm -hmm. dynamic economy. Mm -hmm. um, supply constrained, but it's got some really good demand trends, you know, whether it's due to job growth or due to pe people migration. Um, they're generally between sort of the three to 700,000 and the yielding sort of between four and a half to, to 7%, depending on where you buy around the country. Um, and then you've got your sort of your passive assets, which is, you know, your high cash flow, low capital growth. And, and what you get with that is, you know, cash flow to service your overall portfolio. So when you're looking at building sort of a, a property portfolio, um, it's good to have, you know, a foundational asset, but it's also good to have a passive asset. And passive assets generally are like commercial properties, you know, block of units, um, you know, duplex, triplex. Um, so yeah. So they typically got more tenants in them um, yep. in the in the passive asset. Yeah. Uh, but as you said, experience low capital growth. Uh, what about servicing with those types of properties, uh, Amnon? What, what would you sort of look at? And let's discuss good debt versus bad debt as well. So we've got, we've got the asset classes. Um, do you want to talk to us a little bit more about good debt versus bad debt? Yeah, so before moving that, I think it's important to have the good A team around you. Mm -hmm. So be it the bias agents, your accountants, your mm -hmm. financial planners, and your mortgage brokers. So what we do is that we look at the client's total portfolio, mm -hmm. we look at what their plan is in the next two years, 10 years, and we'll try to reverse engineer that. Now, <clears throat> when, uh, when we say about good debts and bad debts, I want to talk about um, how it impacts your serviceability. So good debts can be anything uh, which is tax deductible. So it's just a property 101 or Robert Kiyosaki, good, <laughs> um, rich dad, poor bad dad thing. So um, bad debts is basically any personal liabilities, could be your credit card, personal loans, car loans, which basically are your biggest borrowing capacity killer. So I had a client who had a credit card, he had three credit cards worth of 38,000 and he hardly used like 3,000. So we reduced the credit card limit to $5,000. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, his serviceability went up by 200,000. Wow. So it's important to, you know, if you want to build a serious portfolio and serious wealth, it's important to reduce or eliminate those bad debts and uh, accumulate the good quality assets, the foundational assets, uh, the accumulation assets and uh, build your wealth through property. So you guys were talking about the A-team, so how do you guys work together? So obviously you're a buyer's agent, you're in finance, uh, where does the client normally turn up to first? Uh, sometimes they come to me first because mm -hmm. you know they, they want to sort of buy their first IP, they want, they want to understand you know, what strategy they should look at, what type of asset class they should buy and then mm -hmm. you know, ask, I'll ask them first if they have a pre-approval, if they don't, sort of I, um, I send them to a mole, but I send them to him anyway for a second opinion. And vice yep. versa, I think. Yep. That's yeah. it. So if the client comes to me and if they want to purchase an asset or a property, and if they are time poor, they want a buyer's agent, then I will do the serviceability uh, calculation first. I'll c uh, come up with the plan and then I'll refer it to Abdullah, saying that client is uh, pre-approved or has a serviceability of X amount, and then they'll have a session with Abdullah. I guess this would lean a lot too into, um, I guess, banking policies. 
How has that changed at the moment? Um, I mean, each bank's a little bit different. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more? Absolutely, about I can talk about yes. the policy all day. So um, every lender has different policy and different policy, different outcomes. So when we uh, touch the first base is assessment rate. Mm -hmm. So um, every bank has a different assessment rate. Now, what is assessment rate? It's basic your basic variable rate uh, versus plus they add 2.5 to 3% to 4% on top of the buffer. This is to cover in case if the interest rate goes up. Uh, so lenders basically they add between 2.5 to 3.5 to 4 percent. So for example, if you have three properties, four properties, and if you are getting assessed at 4 percent assessment rate, that kills your borrowing capacity. So you want to go with a lender who has not that punitive assessment rate. Second is uh, shading. So when mm -hmm. it comes to the bonus commissions, there are lenders who do uh, 30 percent shading, so they'll just take. 70% of your bonus, where there are lenders who will take 100% of your bonus. Same goes with your rental income. There are lenders who will take 90% uh, or 10% shading, <coughs> and some of the lenders will take 80%. Um, third thing, most of the important thing is the valuation. Every lender has uh, different values and valuations, so different lenders, different valuation outcomes. So you'll be surprised at the valuation outcomes that we get with each lenders. Um, fourth, and one of the most important things is, especially if your investment property is on interest only, there are lenders who will take your repayment as P&I into consideration, whereas some lenders only take what your actual repayment, which is your interest only repayment, and that impacts your serviceability big time. So if you we, if we want to build your portfolio, we have to assess the client situation and scenario. Based on that, we will decide which lender to go with. So I guess uh, it, get, it comes to a point where you're going to get maxed out. Um, is that typically happening at four or five properties? And what would you, I guess, advise them when you're getting towards being maxed out? Um, I would say that uh, having a trust really uh, is important, mm -hmm. um, so especially when you are trying to get maxed out. Because, so for example, your first trust, the property that you buy under trust, um, is basically going, you are going to be the beneficiary or the servicing guarantor. It is going to be on your first one. But your second, third one, if it's going to be a heavily positive get property, your trust is self-sustainable to service those ones. So banks won't look at your personal borrowing capacity and they'll just keep on lending you based on what the trust uh, services. Fantastic advice. And uh, I guess over to yourself, um, where are the hot spots? Where are you seeing people wanting to purchase nowadays? Uh, you're doing a little bit of interstate. We spoke uh, off camera. Uh, you've just got back from, uh, I guess you've been, you go to Sydney quite regularly, South Australia, you're over to Perth, you're over to Queensland. Uh, where's the hotspot? Where should people be buying? Yeah, uh, really good question, Steve. I, uh, look, the, the, I think the best regions at the moment are the affordable lifestyle regions mm -hmm. and the regions that are growing like exponentially with, uh, with job growth. So um, Perth, uh, look, s south of Perth, um, They've got a few uh, lithium refineries, and then they're building, the, establishing mm -hmm. some factories there to build to build actual batteries. Um, you've got you know, regional Queensland. Uh, there are you know, a couple of towns, Townsville and and Rockhampton. They they got some really low supply, really good infrastructure projects in place. Um, <coughs> and we've also you know north of Brisbane is really good as well. So um, and South Australia s still shows. I think to me South Australia is, is I, I look at the last two years, and I think it's probably it was a price correction rather than capital growth just because of it's had a lot of years of literally no growth um, so yes yeah, so I, I think uh, you know I think those three sort of the smaller cities will start to ca play catch up to, to we've Melbourne seen a lot of um, we've personally seen a lot of buyers buying over in South Australia yeah. due to affordability um, yeah. for example in Melbourne you're sitting around about a 900 to 1 million as a PPR uh, in Sydney, it's kind of that 1.5 to 2 million. Yeah, correct. And over in uh, over in Adelaide, um, obviously this I guess Australia's best kept secret, <laughs> but you're still buying house and land or, or uh, established properties well under 500,000. Yeah. Um, and if you yeah. Yes. So the capacity has been uh, quite fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, I guess as yourselves, uh, what do you recommend to people in terms of this 18? Um, do you think mindset's certainly an important part to play? Yeah, it's a really good question. I was going to actually touch on that. Yeah. But um, I think every investor, like to, to create a mindset, there's essentially four principles that I follow. And the mm -hmm. first one is, you know, understanding what your goals are. So, you know, what are your short-term and long-term goals? What sort of net worth position do you want to be in 20 or 30 years? You know, do you want to be a self-funded retiree? Um, you know, what sort of passive income do you want at that time? Um, and I think, you know, that's the first principle. The second one is understanding your limitations as an investor. Like mm -hmm. for me, when I started my journey, it was cash flow. 
I needed yeah. cash flow. Cash flow was a big problem for me. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> the, 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 the third one um, is you know building that strategy. Once you understand your goals and, and your limitations, and you can sort of build a strategy to execute the goal. And then the fourth one is your team. So what sort of experts do you have around you, right? So I think you know accountants is really important. Having a broker that understands you know policy is like what mm -hmm. I was just talking about. I think it's absolutely critical. Um, you know, and then a property advisor or a buyer's agent or a <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> That's a land expert. <laughs> yeah, or a land expert. <laughs> well, we obviously love a good healthy debate on the new property mm. show, but uh, <laughs> one thing that we do have in common um, is this, is customer service. Uh, yeah. Last thing I want to leave you with is, look, in the world of phone calls and Zooms and, and everything else and emails, how important is it to meet your client face to face, break some bread, and go through those goals and strategies together? Um, love to hear your feedback on that. Uh, what do you think? Most of my clients are all over Australia, but yeah. whenever I get an opportunity, I would love to then have a face-to-face -face chat. But what we do is every six months, we do have the strategy sessions to check mm -hmm. how the property is going. We do annual reviews on a yearly basis as well. We do upfront valuations to check what um, equity they have so that you know they can keep on buying those property. And um, you know Abdullah does pretty much the same thing. But at the, to answer your questions, um, yes, it is important to have that face-to-face -face connection because yeah. On the Zoom call, it becomes a bit formal, but when you meet face to face, uh, you actually get to know the person. So it is important. So staying in contact. Yeah, I, I like to see them, you know, throughout the journey at least once if they're interstate. But if they're in Melbourne, we see them a couple of times. And we've had, uh, I think, we've had some clients we've worked both together with where we've had like a, you know, sort of a client celebration meeting at the end where we've been able to get some uplift and yep. refinance and go Celebrating again. Celebrating the wins, so yeah. important. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen, for jumping on the uh, new property show. It's been a pleasure to have you uh, on the show. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys soon. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really Thank enjoyed you. Thank it. Thank you so much, Steve. It was lovely having us. Thank you. <laughs> Buyers agents, are they good? Are they bad? Or are they ugly? <laughs> <laughs> no, jokes aside, guys. Um, Buyers agents. A good buyer's agent um, is going to provide value and the value they provide is going to far exceed that of what it costs. So the upfront cost, again over a five, ten year period of the value of the property is going to be immaterial to the decision to buy it. So if you get the right property with the right advice, it's going to be a quality investment. Perfect. Thoughts? Great answer. Definitely agree. We're actually doing a job at the moment in Port Melbourne through a buyer's agent and they've made the whole process real easy for a client from Sydney. So they've just purchased, we're renovating, exceed the value resell, make a profit, very simple. I feel that it's more like a gardening. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do it yourself, mm -hmm. but you need to, uh, to dedicate time and effort, or you can get an, a gardener who knows what to do, how to do it. Um, there's a bit of knowledge which is involved in this, and of course that knowledge base, base especially if you're a first-time investor, you need a bit of hand-holding, and uh, that's where buyer's agent will add value. I think too that I guess one of the most important things with, with using somebody is, is relationships. So one of the keys though would be relationships with the agent. So it's so important the buyer's agent actually gets along with the real estate agent because if, I mean, they could actually open doors or sometimes go against you. Yeah. Do you find that happen sometimes? Yeah, yeah, look, um, I, I, you know, I think a really good buyer's agent is someone who can sort of build relationships quite well and, and build trust because you know, your clients at the, end, at the end of the day is going to leverage off that trust and le leverage off the knowledge that they bring. Um, so, look, I, you know, I've seen it work in most cases. You know, obviously, there's always, you know, there's always people in the industry or buyers agents in the industry in this case that operate a little bit different, and, and you know, there's always stories. But I think, um, I mean, I think also the client relationship with the buyers agent, you know, understanding more about the client and why they're there and the next decision they make. Like we work with a lot of first time investors um, and we've over the last two years we've been able to see some of them go into the second, third and the, I have one client that we're looking at buying their fourth, which is, you know, it becomes a really sort of personable relationship and, you know, the first step, the first property they buy is the hardest because they've got money and they don't know what to do with it and it's just too much, you know, analysis paralysis. And, you know, they don't know whether they should buy a brand new. <laughs> Sorry, That's okay. House and land. <laughs> house and land. Um, you know, which look. You know, I think house and land has its own merits, but it all always depends on 
you know, what is your end goal and what sort of cash flow position do you want to be in? And, you know, do you have the ability where you can, do you, do you have a really good exit strategy? Um, I, I wouldn't say all established properties are good. Hmm. Um, you know, f I would say like, you know, we, we look at probably 30 to 40 properties per client by the time we find the right one on average. Um, That's a lot more than I expected. It's, um, I thought it might have been present three or four properties, but 30 to 40, obviously, you can obviously justify the fees there. Yeah. Um, do you charge your client up front like a commitment fee or how would that work? And what's your thoughts on that? Do you think, what about the guys that work for free, like a real estate agent <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> until the transaction? I guess one's transactional uh, and one's invested in the person. Um, yeah. How do the fees sort of work with, with your client and what's the brief? Yeah, that's a really good question, Steve. Um, look, we always take a fee up front just mm -hmm. to you know, gauge that sort of commitment. And you know, once, once they make that payment, then they're not fully invested until they make that payment. Um, and then once they've made that payment and there's an accountability, then, then we're serious and we're, you know, we're closing a deal in the next eight to nine weeks. Um, you know, the, I think the first step of every process that we take is we actually look at their, the client profile and before we build, establish the brief, we look at their profile and understand what sort of investor they are and what sort of cash flow position are they in, what's their growth look like over the next 10 or 20 years, you know, what sort of, you know, where do they want to be when they retire? And then we sort of reverse engineer that and then we allocate a asset, an asset class for them. And then based on that asset class, then we establish the brief and look at what region to buy into. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. So this particular client we, um, needed, you know, they had a lot of deposit. So we, a lot of equity at the moment. So we, we're looking at their portfolio and they're sort of cash poor in their portfolio. So we're gonna take some of that equity out and we're gonna look at buying them passive asset, so high cash flow asset. Um, Western Australia or Perth, um, is a the, the industrial warehouse vacancy rate is 0.9 percent. So we, we purchased for them a, a commercial property 1.35, yielding at 6.6 percent .6 net. You know that's going to help sort of funnel money into. You know he's, you're working with me on that one, so he's going to help funnel money into you know into his portfolio to help it. You know his overall portfolio sort of neutrally gear. So would you say then that a buyer's agent might be better to use? They might have a wide general knowledge, which is Australia yeah. wide. Um, but what about if you wanted to buy in a local area? So what would you do if you wanted to, say you wanted to buy your principal place of residence, would you rather then go directly to the agency and try and do it yourself uh, and buy directly from the real estate agent? Or at what stage do you think you'd actually engage a, a property agent or buyer's agent? I think for an emotional purchase, like a primary place of residence, mm -hmm. I would probably do majority of that work myself. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a different, you know, type of investment than what an investment property would be. Mm -hmm. So for me, f the way that I would work, I'd have to, I'd engage with the real estate myself. I didn't look at all the properties because I'm going to be the one living mm -hmm. there. And I'd be making an emotional decision around that. Whereas when I look at investment property, I'm just sticking to the numbers. I'm looking at the suburbs, suburb reports, um, ability for capital growth, rental yields, LVRs, you know, finance, leverage, that type of stuff. And that's where a buyer's agent can come in and go, hey, these are some great properties in these areas. Have you thought about these? Um, or areas that I never would have thought about looking at previously. So you'd probably walk through the property yourself, get a feel of what's actually happening. And then I'd almost suggest that you use the buyer's agent, if you could, to help you negotiate, negotiate the price. Yeah, yeah so negotiating. So it's is almost like having a, a silent bidder or somebody on your side that, yeah. that works undisclosed behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. I think definitely when you're you know, if you're novice in purchasing properties, I 100% I because you need to know how to play the game, and it is a game purchasing a property. Mm. Um, you know, I think you know, I think I've done 15 property purchases now, and each time I'd consider I win or lose based on the price that we pay. So, I'd, you know, you've got to offer the right amount of money, offer the right around amount of terms and get the deal done if it's an attractive deal for you. So sometimes using a buyer's agent can really help get that. What about yeah. you, Robbie? Why, why would you choose a buyer's agent if you did? Well, I was nearly going to say, like, what you'd save the client would nearly pay for your fee in the end. Yeah. The, the way I would view it is if I invested X amount into you, I, I believe with your skills and knowledge, you, you would most likely save that purely in the purchase price. So realistically, from a builder's point of view, it's, it's a no-brainer for me. Like, I've actually thought of engaging uh, buyer's advocate and I've actually mm -hmm. spoken to Gary about it because our, our next property would be an investment so yeah I just feel like it's it, it's like you can go own build up but I, I would recommend getting someone like your next to build your house because yeah. we do it every day yeah we, we know the market 
and yeah, it's, it's what, your what do you zone. typically see that others don't? Um, so, for example, um, if you're buying two houses, if you're a mum and dad, uh, there's a there's a corner allotment versus a 20 metre wide frontage and uh, 40 metres. So sometimes having the buyer's agent could be beneficial because there could be development um, prospects. Obviously, on the yeah. new property show, we want to cover everything that's building and yeah. and we want the client to win. What are some of the things that you, that people are missing out on? Yeah, I think it's just the uh, advice and like being able to make that quick decision on what you can do with that block. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, give an example. Like we bought a, a corner block that was 16 k's away from the CBD in Adelaide, and we paid 415 for it. Um, it was advertised for 380, but I said to my, you know, when we, when we went through the due diligence process, we could essentially put three properties on that block because it was a corner block. If it was just a straight inline block, you can only do you can only do two. So we had to value that property a little bit differently to an inline block. So it's just I find a lot of clients don't don't have that knowledge or understanding at, you know in front of them at the time. So you know being able to sort of guide them through that process and find them sort of the best deal that will have you know sort of ramifications later. I think the thing I'll, I guess I'd close on because um, we'll wrap this segment up shortly. But if you're typically dealing with a, a real estate agent, they've only got their own best interests at, at the heart, and Correct. that's the sale of the property. Correct. Um, which, I, which is completely fine because the vendor there needs to sell. So, sorry, real estate agents. Now, <laughs> with that said though, uh, working with a, um, I guess a buyer's agent, you have the purchaser, uh, their, their interests at heart, so you're negotiating the best price, making sure that they haven't overpaid as well because you can also do competitive analysis, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and also making sure that the Poss uh, the property has possible, um, I guess, de development prospects. And probably the last thing I want to add is if you're typically dealing with one agency, you've only got a list of properties, which might be 15 to 20 that's listed. If you're dealing with a buyer's agent, uh, yep. I think I'd vote today that engaging a buyer's agent, I've slightly been convinced, yes. is, is, uh, <laughs> is, the, is the best thing. So closing arguments just before we wrap up, uh, are we going for buyer's agent or not? For yeah, I think it's a great idea. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's important to go for the, the right buyer's agent that's going to help yeah. you execute your brief. Because like you said, if you're buying a PPOR, you want the expert in the, in the suburb that's got that sort of real estate agency sort of perspective. But if you want someone that's, um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if you want someone that's, uh, you know, um, sort of got that wide view uh, or, you know, someone to build a portfolio, a scalable portfolio, I think getting someone that's got that experience will, will help, so yeah. But yeah, buyer's agent, yes. Beautiful. Guys, uh, thanks for joining us. Great debate. Um, have you guys again on the panel shortly. Thanks, thanks Steve. Thanks, Thank Steve. You. And that's all for this week. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week.